Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Wireless Heritage SIG talk on history of time and timing in telecommunications. My name is Andy Sutton, I'm a network architect within BT. I'm also a heritage uh, SIG champion within Cambridge Wireless. So today's talk will introduce the, the need for timing in modern cellular networks from the context of uh, initial requirements for GSM. Uh, being a heritage SIG, we'll look at how that was implemented on an early base station, in this particular case, it would be the uh, Nokia DF12, which was GSM 1800, uh, second generation GSM BTS. We'll talk a little bit about base station oscillator modules and how they evolved over time. And then we'll introduce the concept of taking time from the transmission network, so in particular, uh, the concepts of full scope modulation and the two megabit per second E1 frame. We'll then cover GSM terrestrial interfaces and see how that E1 frame was used to build the GSM network before introducing the synchronisation supply unit and its use within the mobile network. Carrying on further, we'll introduce the concepts of 3G and see how synchronisation changed with 3G and in particular the introduction of ATM as a transport network layer. We'll then talk about converged network sync for 2G and 3G before we introduce 4G and the requirements of LTE, LTE Advanced and LTE Advanced Pro. And then look at what's happening with synchronisation as we evolve 4G networks and uh, we move beyond 4G to 5G. And we'll then summarise the uh, presentation. So the GSM radio interface uh, is TDMA based, Time Division Multiple Access. And the photograph here is a traditional GSM 1800 base station from the kind of early to mid uh, 1990s and this is based upon uh, space diversity reception on the receive path so one of these antennas will both transmit and receive the other will receive only to enhance the uplink <coughs> we have a microwave radio link here for backhaul and this microwave radio would have carried typically a 1E1 circuit so a 2 megabit per second circuit of which n times 64 kilobits per second would actually be utilised for the ABIS interface, so the transmission from the BTS to the BSC itself. And again, we'll explore that ABIS interface and how it uses the 2 megabit frame and how that links in with the story of synchronisation as we go through today's presentation. Key thing to pull out from the, uh, the slide here is the gross data rate on the GSM radio interface of 270.833 kilobits per second. And we'll see reference to that kind of data rate uh, in, in the frequency context very shortly and then we'll start to understand why we use the particular frequency of oscillator that we do within GSM. But effectively that means that there's lots of overheads as you would expect on the radio interface above and beyond what for example would be utilised to support a full rate speech time slot uh, of 13.6k. So looking at that DF12 base station, this is an example from Nokia you could pick out similar examples from other major suppliers, the likes of uh, Ericsson, Alcatel, Nortel, etc., who all provided base station infrastructure in the day. I'll just talk through the base station itself. Uh, we've got the, the kind of station unit at the top. So the three cards here make up the BIE, the base station interface equipment, and they terminate the two megabit incoming circuit and split out the various time slots and sub-time slots for transmission uh, of the, uh, the ABIS interface. We've then got an operations and maintenance unit. Now for those who uh, look closely, you'll see that I've blanked out a card here. You can just see the top of it. Uh, that's simply a, a card that was slotted in in an incorrect position in this particular case because this was in a lab environment. So uh, just ignore that, uh, that, that, that position there. That wouldn't actually be occupied in a normal configuration that Orange deployed in the UK when this particular base station was, uh, was being installed. The actual card I've highlighted here, this is the clock card itself. Now this is an MCLP, so this is taking a, a reference from the incoming line. Uh, we're actually going to talk about an earlier version of this card first, and then we'll come back to, uh, to look at this uh, line-fed card. We've then got some RF test equipment, and two frequency hopping units here. One frequency hopping unit for the primary receiver, one frequency hopping unit for the diversity receiver as well. And then a couple of external alarm and control boards. Moving down to the lower shelf, we've got the power supply here, which is for the station unit. 
A map station unit could support multiple GSM transceivers. In this configuration, we're showing a single GSM transceiver, so this would be an omni configuration, where we've actually then got the power supply for the transceiver itself. We've got two digital signal processing cards, each of which handles four of the eight uh, GSM TDMA time slots on the radio interface. We've then got a frame unit control board that actually connects back up then into the base station interface equipment. We've got the transmitter itself and the primary and diversity receivers. Now you'll notice a few red lights on here. As I mentioned earlier, this is a, a piece of test kit effectively within uh, a switch site. So uh, at this particular time, it was actually powered down from like a transmission perspective, uh, hence the, the red lights on the Normally you would have uh, kind of green operating lights on the transmitter and uh, yeah, everything would be uh, hunky-dory on, uh, on the two frequency hopping units as well. So the key thing is the reference frequency of the oscillator on the clock card is 13 megahertz. So 30 megahertz uh, is a well-known kind of radio interface oscillator frequency for GSM and the evolutions of, uh, of GSM through UMTS and LTE. And the reason is the, uh, the 30 megahertz output could be divided by 48, which gives us 270.833 uh, kilohertz effectively. I'll put kilobits per second here because uh, that matches the, uh, the actual line rate uh, that we're actually going to transmit on the radio interface. If you remember, that TDMA frame had that growth data rate of 270.833 uh, kilobits per second. And from that, we can actually derive a one time bit, uh, which is 48 clock cycles or a 12 clock cycle quarter bit, which is actually the time unity uh, used within a user equipment or an MS as we call it in the days of GSM, a mobile station. So we've got a 13 megahertz clock reference. Now the original clock cards contained very, very high accuracy oscillators because effectively they were standalone. There was no source of reference or discipline for the oscillator that was installed in the base station. So this is an example uh, taken from some early Nokia training notes of the MCLU, this kind of master clock unit. Uh, but this is actually operating, as I say, without any kind of line reference. So effectively, you've got three LEDs, the alarm, power, and operation LED on the front, as we saw on the other cards. Uh, we've got a potentiometer here that says adjust. And we've got a test point here for the 13 megahertz clock. Now with this particular type of oscillator, Effectively, you had to visit the site every six months or so with a highly accurate frequency counter, uh, typically with a rubidium reference, so they were quite expensive beasts. It took a while to kind of heat up as well and get up to temperature before you could actually do any kind of adjustment. And literally, as high-tech as GSM was, it all came down to an old trimming tool, effectively, where the actual potentiometer was adjusted to actually set the reading on the rubidium based frequency counter to exactly 13 megahertz. And you would simply adjust the pot until that reading was correct. Now that would be a huge drain on resource, of course, because it had to be done every six months, plus the cost of buying uh, the cards themselves with very stable oscillators and the cost of buying yeah, a number of rubidium based frequency counters as well. So the plan was to come up with an alternative technique of disciplining the oscillator such that uh, the operation of the network could be stabilised, we would have no need to visit site regularly, and actually you could use a cheaper oscillator in a clock card if that clock, clock card was constantly disciplined by some kind of reference that you had some confidence in. So, the idea was to move away from the MCLU card to the MCLP. Now the P in this particular case stands for PCM, pulse code modulation. Um, what it strictly means is a two megabit per second line. The two megabit per second line, as we'll see over the next few slides, is by design synchronous, because again, that's time division multiplex based. Uh, and by using the two megabit line to provide a discipline for the oscillator, we didn't have the requirement to visit site. So therefore, once the system's up and running, everything is fine. You see here now we've got a 13 megahertz test point. We do need to take a reading on the card, but you no longer have the potentiometer to adjust it. If you need to do a fast tune, you can actually log in via the uh, operations and maintenance unit and change the, uh, the DAC word, the digital value, 
um, quickly bring the card into frequency. So for example, when you're installing a new card or commissioning a new base station. So here we see now uh, a diagram of that MCLP based card. Now, the specification for the radio interface is 50 parts per billion. But to maintain 50 parts per billion on the radio interface, we need an incoming reference that's accurate to 15 parts per billion. And that allows some budget then for, uh, for movement within the base station itself. So the 2 megabit reference comes in, carrying the ABIS interface into the bit BIE, the base station interface equipment, and in particular into the DB2M card, digital branching 2 megabit card, on the DF12 base station. Obviously, as base station generations evolve, that, that card type has changed. Uh, we've then got an OMU signaling link going through to the operations and maintenance unit where we've got the hardware database. And we've got a reference clock that feeds into a comparator, and effectively a phase lock loop, um, where the digital word value feeds that OCXO. Okay, so we've now got uh, you know, an oven controlled quartz oscillator in there, and the outcome is 13 megahertz. And we can keep that clock stable through this loop and the reference we've got on the E1 line itself. So, why is the incoming line synchronous then? It's worth spending some time just thinking about this now because we've kind of used the incoming 2 megabit line for many, many years now for synchronization. And when we moved away from 2 megabit lines, we suddenly had a new challenge. If we're going to move from 2 megabit and TDM systems to Ethernet, yeah, we need to get synchronization into Ethernet as well. So let's first look at uh, why this line is in fact synchronized, and then we'll see later in the presentation how we adopt some of these techniques in carrier Ethernet today. So the need for some thought of uh, synchronization in telecommunications yeah, has always been there. You know, it's either a case of you talk or I talk, you know, telecommunications has uh, evolved, particularly over the last 50 years, the main need for synchronization has been driven by the adoption of pulse code modulation. And pulse code modulation was originally adopted as a transmission technology, so it was effectively used between switches to actually drive long lines, you don't get the same build-up of noise that you get in, uh, in analog amplifiers, for example, you can clean the signal up at uh, each regeneration point and you can recover the signal uh, very effectively at the end. So uh, we've got an example, a wonderful image here from BT Archives and you'll see one of these racks of equipment in the Information Age Gallery at the Science Museum as well. To learn more about the history of pulse code modulation, there's a great series of books that were produced by Marconi Instruments some years ago. Uh, I picked this one up on eBay, uh, they're generally available fairly cost effectively. There are three versions of this book made uh, over the years. And this explains the story of pulse code modulation. Now, PCM itself was developed by an English engineer working in Paris at the time, uh, in 1937, uh, a gentleman called Alex Reeves. Uh, and the technology was developed from a theoretical model. So actually, at the time in 1937, it wasn't practically possible to realize PCM. We had to wait until the advent of the transistor and uh, more developed electronics to realize PCM networks, but nonetheless the theory was established uh, back in 1937. Now the GPO, the, the, the forerunner of BT, uh, from a naming perspective, so the company I work for, um, really did embrace the idea of digital transmission and actually led the world in the development of pulse code modulation systems to increase transmission capacity and performance on lines between exchanges. But actually, it wasn't long after the introduction of PCM transmission that we saw the introduction of the first digital PCM-based switch. So now we start to think about uh, a transmission line coming in that's carrying time slots. So you've got a little piece of information in one time slot that has to be cross-connected across a switch and leave on a transmission line at a designated time slot again. So you've got the need for synchronization, not only in the transmission, but across the switch as well. And early digital switches often had a rubidium frequency reference uh, on board. Uh, in fact, some of the very early ones actually had cesium rather than rubidium. So cesium tended to be uh, deployed into the actual switch itself. So a very accurate, very expensive clock to guarantee that performance. But over time, again, developments in oscillators, meant you didn't need to have a cesium reference on every switch. 
Um, and in fact, you could deploy a small number in your network and carry synchronization over the line. So the concept of synchronization as an art of telecommunications, as a technology in telecommunications, is very well developed. But actually, it's not something that's understood by many engineers at all. It, it tends to be out there, it works. Uh, but when it goes faulty, it can cause real problems, particularly on mobile networks when you start getting dropped calls uh, and potentially even out of band radiation from base stations. So, synchronization is an absolutely critical topic. So, um, Empress Exchange near Earl's Court in London was the world's first fully digital telephone exchange and that opened in uh, September 1968. And then we actually developed that frame further to deliver a whole range of access circuits as well. Where if we take an example here, we've got the frame from an E1 circuit. So 32 time slots, 64 kilobits per second per time slot. Time slot zero is what we call a frame alignment word, a not frame alignment word. So this actually does frame synchronization, alternates between frame alignment and not frame alignment. So you actually get the correct synchronization. I've numbered one to eight, the number of bits in each 64 kilobit per second frame, because 64 kilobits is the basic building block of the PSTN, the Public Switch Telephone Network. However, as we'll see shortly, uh, we used uh, a lower